we have an invitation. And I thought for the invitation, I would tell you about an invitation that I received <laughs> to come to a presentation which uh, started this weekend uh, and uh, where they were going to have they were going to have somebody um, whom they called doctor speak about uh, science and evolution and the bible and this kind of thing and uh, I noticed among the topics uh, of the of the week, there were there was a, one evening. The topic is science versus evolution, which I thought was an odd topic for a Bible sermon in a Church of Christ. Science versus evolution. I think I would rather hear what the Bible has to say. And it wasn't the only one. I think there was science versus evolution's timeline for the age of the earth. Not sure what verse that is. But again, I'd rather hear what the Bible has to say. Um, it's an odd thing, you know, and the appeal is to this fellow's a doctor and he had some kind of major or minor in his undergraduate days about biological sciences and evolution, something, 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 whatever. Don't care. Here's the thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's not faith, and that's not the genesis of faith. That's not where faith comes from. And you're not fooling anybody. Uh Turns out this fellow's doctor is a medical doctor. Uh, he's a dentist. So I don't know why I care about his opinion about evolution or anything else on that matter, but, but the deal is, is we need the Bible to be proclaimed, and we need the Bible to be the un, unabashed proof about God and his will for us and why... He wants us to, to be here and what he wants us to do. And when we put forward things like that, we're just setting ourselves up to be knocked down by the world. I mean, anybody who actually does have a, a PhD in science of evolution or geology or whatever else, I'm sure has a lot of interesting things to say about the assertions being made in this, in this uh, sermon, because those are sciences. And um, even if I could show through science that, you know, if I could convince you through science and scientific proofs that the earth was young and that evolution at a large scale or crossing species or whatever is not true, and you became convinced of that because of the science and the scientific evidence that was presented to you, the result of that would not be that you are a Christian. The result of that would be that you are a scientist with a different opinion now. Those aren't the same thing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. If we want to make faith, we have to use the word of God to do it. So there is something to this proverb, Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Do answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. And this is the crux of the matter. Is that what we're doing? Are we saying, you know, I suppose what I'm saying is, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. That in trying to answer the arguments of science and pretending that you are an expert in a specific field of science makes you just like the scientists who pretend to know about the God whom they decry. 
or pretend to know something about the creative power of God whom they deny. It, it's no different. And most people, I think, in the world can see right through that. But I'm sure that the answer from him would be, no, you have to answer them according to their folly. You have to show them that their own science doesn't accept this, lest they be wise in their own eyes. They have to learn first that, that, that it's uh, reasonable. And, ah, those kinds of arguments, I'm afraid, are, are they just prove too much. Why is human thinking, human reasoning, human tradition reasonable but the Bible has to be proved. Why can't the Bible be reasonable and let human ideas be proven? So no, we need to be instead kind of on the defensive against those kinds of things because they're actually harmful to faith. You know, in Matthew 13, when Jesus was doing miracles, when he was on earth, walking among us, and he went back, you know, went back to Nazareth. They were astonished at all the things that he taught, and they were astonished at the mighty works that were attributed to his name. But the answer that they gave at the 54th verse was, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Isn't this the carpenter's son? They took offense at him. The 58th verse is our verse, which says he didn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. You know, sometimes you can't get through. Sometimes people just don't believe and they just will not. They don't want to. Even if Jesus had done mighty works in their presence because they wouldn't believe, because they weren't searching for the Lord's anointed, they weren't looking at the scriptures, there's no reason. It's not as though doing those mighty works was going to generate belief. People have this mistaken notion that the miracles were uh, would make people believe in them. No, 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 no. Remember what Abraham told the rich man in the account of the rich man and Lazarus. If they do not believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe though someone rises from the dead. No, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. In this place where you, you might think he could do all kinds of things, and he knew these people, it was his hometown, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. he didn't do a lot of works because they didn't believe. In another place, he said, don't cast your pearl before swine. It's true that sometimes people are just not ready for this. They just are not going to accept this. I'm reminded of Acts 17 where Paul shows up in Athens and speaks appealing to those who are worshiping the unknown God. And some of them derided it. Some of them mocked the idea of the resurrection of the dead. Oh, yeah, and speaking of the resurrection of the dead. Hmm. It seems to me like we have a much larger problem on our hands than a question of the method by which God created the earth or when he did it or how long it took him to do it. Those are all qualifiers, you know. That it came before now, that's accepted. You know, that he did this, not mankind, yeah, that's accepted, right? Everybody accepts that. They're just arguing about when did he do it and how did he do it and how long did it take him to do it. That's all. It's just qualifiers. That one's actually kind of small. The biggest problem that you face as a Christian, if your concern is scientific proof, the biggest problem you face is that there is not yet any scientific proof for somebody to come back from the dead. 
Nobody dying today is going to come back to life. There's no way to prove that. I'd like to see the science behind the resurrection from the dead. There isn't any, as you know. It's by the power of God. It's by faith. At 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18 is the powerful verse. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise, the discernment of the discerning I'll thwart. Where is the, the one who's wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Since in the wisdom of God, the world didn't know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews a stumbling block, to Gentiles folly. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. Yes, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But so many of my brethren have set about to prove Paul wrong. They want to prove, they want to change the word of the cross from folly to wisdom. When God said in the minds of the perishing, it's folly. You're not fighting, you know, you're not fighting with me, you're not fighting with us, you're fighting with God. There are times when people can't be reached. There are times when they don't believe. That's not what you're trying to do is is turn this around and change the order of things. It's going to be the case that God will be reached by those who are humble. Those who are called or those who are humble, who are willing to accept correction, who are willing to look at what God says, who are willing to repent. And not everybody is willing to do those things at every time. Now, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, and you're not going to change that. If somebody's mind is set for, on perishing, there's no way to make the word of the cross seem wise to them. It's the design of God that salvation comes by faith. We must be saved by faith. And when people have doubts because of what they can see with their eyes, you know, Idolatry, perhaps, or science, perhaps, or whatever. What can be seen with the eyes, that's not faith. That's the thing that controls people's lives, and that's how they order and make their decisions. They're not walking by faith, and you cannot be saved that way. We walk by faith and not by sight. you got to believe in God. you got to trust God. I'm sad for my brethren being hoodwinked by this stuff. I'm sad for the harm that it does to the reputation of the church. I understand that people want to be thought of as intelligent and want to be thought of as not a bunch of fools, and there's a lot of uh, antagonistic you know, vitriol out there against the Bible and against God, and they will leverage things like you know, evolution, whatever else. I understand that, but it's not different from any of the others. A resurrection of the dead is not provable either. There's a whole lot of other things. The children of Israel across the Red Sea is on dry land. God flooded the entire world in the days of Noah, saving eight alive. There's so many things there. We have to believe God because of his word. And yet, his word is fabulous, and his word is amazing. And the things that happened there, no man could come up with. His word provides proofs for us. You know, have you looked at Psalm 19 lately? <laughs> the Bible does talk about evidence and things that can be observed by all people. Everywhere in life, every time, every age, every nation can see the sun, the moon, the stars, the order of the creation. 
This is a beautiful thing. And no man came up with the things that are written in God's word. Open this for yourself and see. No, God doesn't need our help. And he doesn't need other proofs besides the ones that he has sent. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in the power of God to save? With just a word, let him only say the word and his servant will be healed. If today you are not a Christian, become a Christian. Believe in God's power to save and God's power to resurrect. Why should he be limited? Why is it incredible that he raises the dead? Why shouldn't that be believable? He who created time must be timeless. Who created physics must not be governed by it. There are many things we know about God just from observation. That's true. If today you're not a Christian, be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of your sins and simple trusting faith and humility. If we can help you today, to obey, we're glad to do it. If you're a Christian and haven't lived right, repent and come back to God. Look again at his word as the strength. His word as the power. His word is the unifier. His word is the hope of the next generation. If you need our prayers to strengthen you in your resolve to serve God, let us help you with that too. If we can pray with you, if we can help you to obey the gospel, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing.